Hello, I am Cliff Smith, the Washington Project Director of the Middle East Forum. Um, welcome to our webinar and podcast series. Today, we have a very special and unusual guest in Mr. Mirdad Kansari. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, you are. Yeah, great. Uh, let me just tell you very briefly why he is so unusual and special. Um, for one thing, Mr. Kansari is our only webinar watcher turned guest in the Middle East Forum's history. I noticed some very use, um, smart, detailed, and thoughtful questions in the comments um, from an unusual name and, and from some of our previous webinars. Um, they were from Mr. Kansari. It made me want to look him up and see what his background was, which leads me to my second reason. Um, Mr. Kansari is a former Iranian diplomat. He began as an intern in the Iranian Foreign Service right before his 20th birthday. Later, after graduating from Georgetown University in DC, he joined the Iranian Foreign Service in 1972. He served for several years in a number of places, including the United Nations, um, but he resigned from the Iranian Foreign Service in 1979, um, following the Islamic Revolution after his boss, the Iranian Foreign Minister, was executed. Since that time, he has worked in a number of different international business positions and also as a key player in the Iranian diaspora, working on issues regarding um, his old former country. He now lives in the UK. Uh, welcome, Mr. Kansari. Do I have all that facts right? Yes, you do. Thank you very much. Great. Um, well, look, um, just briefly, I first, uh, I will let you, second, I will let you get to anything you want to about the internal of the Iranian regime, but can you just tell quickly a little bit about uh, your time in the Iranian Foreign Service and your decision to leave? Yes, well, uh, I, as you mentioned, entered the Iranian Foreign Service immediately upon graduating from the School of Foreign Service in Washington and Georgetown University. I served in uh, the UN, subsequently was sent on a scholarship to the Fletcher School. I then was appointed as press attache to the Iranian embassy in London and had to go through the Iranian revolution serving in that capacity. I uh, did not think, and quite honestly, that uh, what would come as a result of the revolution would lead my country in this direction or behave in this way. But uh, on the day, about a month or so of debating, they executed the man I had served in his office in Tehran, the a respected diplomat, Iranian foreign minister. And that was the day when I decided to resign. And uh, from a year after that, although I had to find a new, new way of living, and I was working with the Saudi corporation for four or five years, but I gradually entered the Iranian political scene and became foreign policy advisor to our former prime minister, uh, who was assassinated later in France, Dr. Shapur Bakhtiar. And since then, I have worked with a, a number of uh, opposition leaders and so on and so forth, and tried to see uh, ways in which uh, the removal of this present clique of fundamentalists rulers could be achieved and the country set on a path of modernization, democracy, and progress. And this in I, short is what I've been doing for almost 40 years. And, and that was what I was about to get to next. If you could speak up a little bit, um, some of our guests seem to have trouble hearing, so you can just raise your voice a little bit, that'd be great. <laughs> yes. But yes, please do tell us, um, what is the state of um, Iran right now, both in terms of the government and in terms of the people who would like something different from what they currently see? Well, I think the most important, uh, you know, from, you know, from the prospect of uh, people such as yourself and, you know, your webinar that focuses on what Iran is doing in the region, what Iran is doing in terms of its nuclear program, the provocations that the Islamic regime has ca caused in the region and in the international arena, it's important to understand that the first and foremost and the biggest victim of the fundamentalist Islamic regime in Iran is the people of Iran whose lives and future prospects have been profoundly damaged. So this is a very important factor to bear in mind. This regime is, does not any longer enjoy the support of the people that it once did in the aftermath of the revolution, but today the overwhelming majority of Iranians beset by runaway inflation, rising unemployment, you know, are longing 
that a major transformation from the current status quo to something that would prevent their, their lives from suffocating is badly needed. But you know, they are averse to violence and they are scared that by acting you know, uh, in a way that is not calculated and measured that in wanting better lives that they can wind up in a situation like Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan. So this has been a barrier in, in their thinking, but the fact is that they are looking for ways in terms of how they can peacefully advocate uh, a policy of transition away from the fundamentalist regime and towards something much more exclusive that offers them a better future. So on that, um... In a recent article in, um, again, tell me if I'm saying this right, that Kahan Life, which is a media outlet for Iranian expats, you argue that Iran has never had more potential for change than it does right now since the revolution. Well, let me quote you. Drawing lessons from other successful struggles, such as a peaceful transition in South Africa, which replaced a racist apartheid regime with a vibrant democracy, millions of democratic-minded Iranians committed to the principle of popular sovereignty can now focus their attention solely on the deep state with a single determination that they can salvage their future of their nation. And namely a new democratic constitution free of all theocratic aberrations, which respects the rights of all Iranians for equality, justice, and peaceful coexistence. Um, that's very strong language, um, but you meant use the term deep state, a term that has been bandered around in the US a lot, but which means something different in an Iranian context, I would say. What is it in this context you mean by an Iranian deep state? Okay, let, let me explain to you, because this is a very important thing. When we talk about overwhelming majority of people being against the regime, we're talking about the general population who have suffered economically, they've been suppressed, they've been killed, they've been, uh, their human rights have been violated, all of these things. But the group that is referred to as a deep state, when Khomeini first took over, the constituency that represented him was a 100% constituency, people who believed in his ideology, people who followed his teachings, people who uh, accepted his version of Islam. His doctrine, his personal doctrine of religious uh, jurisprudence, you know, the jurisprudence of the cl clergy was incorporated into the Iranian constitution. This effectively meant that all Iranian citizens were minors and that they were incapable of determining what their political future should be, a right that they should delegate to the clergy who will exercise that right on their behalf. As grotesque as that sounds, this doctrine has been incorporated into the national constitution of Iran. That is the constitution that is in place. However, with the passage of time, with the failures of the regime, with the decline of Iranian life, economy, social status, international status, many of the people who originally supported Khomeini and his revolution have gradually distanced themselves from him. If you look at Iran today, you will see people like Former Prime Minister Mousavi has been in, under house arrest for 13 years for disagreeing with the falsified results of an election that was, you know, that gave Ahmadinejad the uh, presidency in 2009. President Khatami, a popularly elected man who wanted to achieve reforms, to reform the system, to make it a law abiding system, has been silenced. Nowhere is, any, is there any mention of him or his, his picture allowed to be shown within Iran. And it goes on. The, we have reached a situation today, which is very important, that people, the critics of those who have been left behind, who are referred to as a deep state, that is a minority of people holding all the key levers of power from Khomeini's initial constituency, the opposition to that today ranges from the son of the late Shah of Iran to the daughter of the late President Rafsanjani, who, although unconnected or you know, in no way associated with one another, but they are talking about 
more or less the same kind of principles that should be adopted for the future of Iran. Uh, when you and I have spoken before, you've mentioned that you believe Iran is strong abroad in places like Iraq and Lebanon, but weak at home. Can you explain why you believe this and what you think the implications are for US policy? Well, I think that this is again another key issue. I think there has been a great deal of focus played, paid to the role that Iran is playing in the region. And the Iranian leadership, the deep state, the deep state constitutes, by the way, no more than at best 15% of Khomeini's original constituency, though they hold all the key levers of power. The deep state is anxious to keep the international community engaged in trying to sort of neutralize Iranian policies in the region, whether it's in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, with Hamas, or now more recently in Yemen, where the Yemeni Houthis now have the capability of, capability of attacking Israel by drones. So by trying to keep attention focused on these areas, they have deliberately tried to distract attention from the woes they face with their own population. So long as this trend continues, the Iranians will have success in terms of keeping the international pressures away from the, where they really feel the pinch. They have invested heavily in surrogate elements and proxy forces in the region, and they have acted you know, strongly in trying to promote this asymmetric uh, strategy of deterrence. You hear is Israeli leaders talking about potential attacks against Iran, but they know that the Iranians are in a position of inflicting some damage to them, and that has always been a major deterrent. Calculations of that nature has kept people away from focusing on where the real Achilles heel of the regime is, which is inside Iran and amongst its own population, where it has no solutions to offer and it has no future. That actually plays perfectly into the next question I was going to ask, and that is, um, what are the best tools that the US government and or Iranian diaspora for that matter have in trying to influence Iran, the, the regime and influence people that are opposed the regime into creating a more humane, more democratic Iranian government? Well, first of all, you have to realize that for the past six months, I'm just, just as an example, because these things have happened intermittently in the past, uh, for the past six months, there have been daily demonstrations in more than 60 to 80 towns and cities all around Iran, protesting against uh, conditions of life, whether it's by various unions or whether it's by ordinary citizens deprived of drinking water or the rising price of bread, which is the most basic staple. And this is a rich country. This is a country whose wealth has been squandered by a corrupt uh, elite that have, you know, that have really drained the country of all its resources and so on. But there is hardly any mention of that. The world is now, especially now, they are focused on the Ukraine uh, situation, which has come to the aid of the Islamic uh, leadership in diverting attention away from themselves, empowering the people in Iran, and that is the role that uh, that is a role that morally obliges the international community to see the plight of the Iranian people to try and help them. And that is a role that the diaspora can play in supporting elements, uh, people who have stood up against the regime, people who are being punished and so on, by empowering them, by trying to find ways of assisting them. That is the way that that constituency within the country can begin to challenge the deep state. So right now, the deep state has created the situation whereby there is no organized force opposing them. They quash and suppress, imprison and torture and murder anybody who stands against them. But if that critical mass to challenge them was to be assisted by the international community who are complaining about Iran's various policies, whether it's in the region or whether it's you know, in terrorism or 
nuclear or this or that, but omitting to mention anything about that. If that critical mass is challenged, then the regime will not be able to get away with much of their activities in the region because the policies that they advocate in the region are basically abhorrent to the overwhelming majority of Iranians. What is there any specific tools that we can use to support them, to give them a voice, to make their efforts more successful? Well, first and foremost is giving recognition, manifest, manifestly recognizing their plight. As I've said, you know, in, in uh, a couple of years ago, there were demonstrations in which, you know, at least several hundred people were killed, thousands were arrested, and that received some coverage. But the plight of the Iranians who have been protesting in the streets essentially since last summer, when the hottest areas of the country in the south, next to the Persian Gulf, were denied a basic drinking water. People did not have that. They came to the street not to protest against you know, the policies or the politics of the country, but to the fact that basic services were being denied to them. But hardly any mention of that is made. I'm saying that there are key people, decent people, leaders from uh, all segments of Iranian society, united, as you mentioned in that piece from my article, in wanting to be focused against one target, which is the deep state, with one single demand. That is a new constitution based on the will of the people and not on religious aberrations. Mm -hmm. This empowering this message and having Western leaders speak directly and in support of these demands, uh, I think would uh, greatly change the situation from within and help Iranians to understand that their plight is being recognized and that people are not just interested in making deals over their heads with a, 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 a regime that lies and cheats and uses opportunities for the promotion of its heinous uh, objects, objectives. Well, I will ask another one, one or two questions and we'll get to audience questions shortly thereafter. So anybody that wants to ask questions, you can type it into the Q&A box and uh, I'll pick the best ones. Um, one other question is um, right now, um, most Arab countries as well as Israel are trying in one way or another to convince the Biden administration to be tougher on Iran uh, do you think this will be successful? Should it be? What should the policies of Arab countries Israel be towards Iran? Well, I think, the, as you mentioned earlier, the most basic problem with this is that you are trying to, uh, the Arab countries in Israel, as well as the United States, are trying to confront Iran and to defeat Iran where it is the strongest, and that's in the region, where they have strong proxy forces that have been equipped and are constantly re-equipped if a nuclear agreement is signed, which I expect it to be signed, uh, some hundred billion dollars will become available to Iran, most of which will be allocated to keeping these proxies in their positions in order to fend off the kind of opposition that they feel could threaten them were they not in place. So in my view, Whilst these, uh, these potential hotspots need to be looked at and safeguarded against, but focus should be made to see where is the underlying weakness of this regime. That is not in the region, that is within Iran. Hardly any effort is being made in any material way to try to uh, look at that problem and to see how that problem can be used as leverage to force the Islamic regime into making concessions, not just to the international community, but to its own people by agreeing to this national, national reconciliation that will move Iran away from the kind of policies and the kind of government it has, just as they did in South Africa. This did not happen. The transition in South Africa did not happen without international assistance. That international assistance could be uh, given in more or less the same way, obviously not this, exactly the same way, but in similar fashion to the people of Iran and to their leaders in order that they can make that kind of a transition. Uh, you, you mentioned um, the international community being 
um, important in um, pushing the regime into a place where the people are listened to. Um, are there, and this is a question from um, Larry Greenberg in our audience, uh, are there international players that are sufficiently outraged about Iran's policies to sort of make this happen? Is there, is there movements in any countries that you see as being um, working towards making this happen? I, I honestly don't see that this day. And, you know, as a veteran who's been around for the last 40 years, there was some movement in this direction in the early years after the revolution, especially in the aftermath of the American hostage crisis. But essentially, the international community from the late 80s, you know, has been trying to see how it can somehow come to some kind of a modus vivendi with this current regime. And attention, and they, they have been masters at diverting attentions away from this kind of thing by keeping all the Europeans or the Americans occupied with the kind of problems that they are confronted. And the regional states in Israel, they are concerned about what is happening in, 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 in Lebanon with Hezbollah or in Syria and so on and so forth. But the roots, the, I mean, those are the branches of the trees, whereas the root of the tree is inside Iran. And it is inside Iran where this current regime is facing its major threat, not over there, but inside Iran and amongst its own people. And that has not been addressed in any way, in any way and shape that is, one could really term as adequate or sufficient. Understood, thank you. Um... Let's see here. Um, from Richard Galber in our audience, um, I have read that there are merchants in the bazaars of Tehran joining the protests. Um, when that happens, there would be an opportunity for change. Do you believe that's true? Do you believe they are, are there are some already involved in such protests? How does how do you think that would how would you look at that issue? I think that uh, I think that the economic sector in Iran, of course, the bazaar, you know, traditionally. They have always supported the religious establishment, but they are suffering because of the sanctions. How much can they, how, for how long can they import goods and then just add a price to it themselves and sell it on? People are impoverished. People do not have 80, over 80% 80 of the Iranian population are living below the poverty and the extreme poverty line. This is used to be one of the richest countries in the region, on par with Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, and look what's happened. So of course they're, they're unhappy. Uh, and you know, the, one of the greatest opportunities, a window of opportunity has been the election or so-called election, what the Iranians refer to as selection of Ibrahim Raisi as president. He is a member of the deep state. Before, a year ago, you had President Rouhani or people like uh, Foreign Minister Zarif who had the knowledge or had the uh, savvy to understand that, you know, there is a different way to go. This guy is, represents only ideology worse than Ahmadinejad. So for, th for the next three years while he's there, there is a window of opportunity to assist all reform-minded Iranians inside and outside to be able to get their campaign into a mode that can seriously challenge the deep state. And I am sure that the support of the private sector and the bazaar, as well as, uh, please, this is important, the overwhelming majority of the religious establishment. This is something that uh, confounds most observers who are not aware. The overwhelming majority of the religious establishment in Iran are against the present uh, leadership on religious grounds. This is something, I mean, the largest uh, religious leader, Shiite Muslim religious leader in Iran with the largest following is Ayatollah Sistani, whose doctrine, whose principles of teaching goes against those of Ayatollah Khamenei. He is based in Iraq, but there are others in Qom and other religious centers in Iran who shared similar views. And that is hardly ever given any not notice to by the media or by 
politicians in Europe or the United States. Um, from Barbara, uh, our audience, um, are the various Iranian opposition groups um, to the regime working together in any way, or are they completely separated? Sadly, uh, the Iranian opposition outside Iran uh, has remained more or less stagnant, basically, the majority of them, with slogans and policies that belong to maybe 10, 20 years ago, as opposed to now. But within Iran, there is an increasing support for this concept of national reconciliation. Even people like former President Khatami and Rouhani have spoken about national reconciliation, something that Ayatollah Khamenei has immediately uh, clamped down against and spoken against. So that is the trend. Reform, moving away from the current constitution based on religious uh, theocratic dictatorship for all the people who believe in the democratic rules of the game, national reconciliation along, the, along with the construction of a new constitution based on popular will is something that we would adhere to. Work needs to be done in organizing it, but this will come about because they are united in purpose and they have said so, and they express this sense of unity from the various corners in which they speak and they make, uh, you know, their, they make their policies known to the Iranian people. There are multiple questions from our audience asking essentially the same thing. And that is, um, do you believe there are cracks within the military or the security or other dissatisfaction in the military or security apparatus that could lead to change of the government in any way? Uh, I this is a very sort of a difficult area to be able to sort of speak with any measure of reliability. The fact is, but apart from the hierarchy in the Revolutionary Guard, that is behind Ayatollah Khamenei, as you know, he appoints them himself. And even there are signs of cracks there. Only last week, the leader of the head of the IRGC intelligence was removed, as was the uh, head of the personnel charged with uh, guarding Ayatollah Khamenei himself because of the rumored, rumored basically because of the incursions the Israelis have been able to make within Iran and essentially assassinating and doing things inside the country for which these organizations had proven capable of resisting. But apart from that small clique of, uh, you might say, leaders within these organizations that are tied intrinsically with the deep state, you have to remember that the majority of all the others, including many leaders within the IRGC who have spoken against such policies, as well as the regular armed forces, which is the, you might say, the 200 pound guerrilla sitting in the room, because the Iranian land forces, the Iranian uh, in, you know, uh, armed forces, the land forces are, in terms of numbers, three times the size of the IRGC put together. All of these people come from Iranian society. Their wives and daughters and fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers and uncles are members of the suffering society. So to what extent they would be willing to stand up for this regime that has ruined the lives of the overwhelming majority of people within Iran is, is a matter that one, uh, one does not know, but you cannot sort of assume that they will go on endlessly supporting a corrupt dictatorship that is making life and the future of future generations of Iranians just, you know, uh, playing with that and doing away with it and subjecting it to the kind of harshness that we are witnessing at this stage. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we are just about out of time. So I just wanted to thank you very much for joining us today and taking questions from me and our audience. And uh, we just thank you very much. And it's great to have a, a former webinar viewer turned guest um, with us today. And uh, again, join us later this week for more and ongoing throughout the rest of the year. Thank you again, Mr. Kansari. I'll talk to you later. Thank you very much, Cliff. And many thanks to MEF for having 
uh, giving elevation to a mere viewer and giving him the platform to speak. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you. To all.